Street Corridor Tara, will you please confirm that our audio and video connections are working? Thank you. I'm now going to call the hearing to order. For the record, it is Wednesday, November 30th, 2022. The time is 6.32 p.m. We are assembled at the SAU 87 office located at 16 School Street in Greenville, New Hampshire. In addition to in-person participation, we are using the GoToWebinar platform to offer remote participation in this hearing. This public hearing, the purpose of which is to receive comments on a standard permit application for a collection, storage, and transfer facility from Greater Waste Solutions, LLC, officially named Greater Waste Solutions, located in Greenville, New Hampshire, is now officially open and is being recorded. My name is Leah McKenna. I am the administrator of the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services Solid Waste Management Bureau, and I am the presiding officer for this public hearing. During the hearing, I may refer to the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services as NHDES, the department or DES. I'd like to take a moment to introduce you to the team that we have supporting this public hearing. You see me here, the center of the table. To my left is Jamie Colby of the Solid Waste Management Bureau, Tara Albert of the Solid Waste Management Bureau, and Mark Condellis to my right of the Solid Waste Management Bureau. And also back at our office in Concord, we have Julie Ashton of the Waste Management Division. Tara Albert is coordinating use of the hearing software here tonight, and Julie Ashton is coordinating support for me. If you would like to speak during the hearing, you will need to either attend in person here at the SAU 87 office, or register for and join the webinar from a computer or an iOS, Android, or Windows device. All participants joining us online have the opportunity to listen in real time to this hearing through the GoToWebinar platform and when invited by the hearing officer, online and in-person participants will be able to speak through the GoToWebinar platform. Telephone participants are only able to listen to the hearing. A link to register for and access this hearing online is included in the Notice of Public Hearing posted on the DES Solid Waste Management Bureau's webpage under the latest news section. Tara, do we have any online participants? Yes. At this time, I'm going to provide an introduction to GoToWebinar for our online participants. Periodically throughout the hearing, I will provide instructions on how to use GoToWebinar. We will turn on and describe certain functions of the software when we are soliciting testimony. When you are logged in to GoToWebinar, you will see an orange rectangle with a white arrow in the upper corner of your screen. Clicking this arrow will show the dashboard that I will refer to when providing instructions later in the hearing. Right now, all online attendees are muted with no video feed and you should be able to hear, see and hear DES staff. Online attendees will remain in this state until the floor is open at which time we will turn on and describe the functions of the webinar that will allow our, our remote attendees to participate. DES will manage the software for the in-person participants. For remote participants, I will provide detailed instructions on how to request to speak when we open the floor. Please note when you are unmuted and speaking, DES and all other attendees will hear you, but your video feed will not be transmitted at all tonight. If you need assistance with GoToWebinar, Again, we have Julie Ashton of DES standing by to help. I will read her phone number and email address now, and her contact information will be posted on the screen intermittently through the hearing. You can reach Julie by phone at area code 603-271-7837 or by email at julie.a.ashton at des.nh.gov. <laughs> Again, I will provide more instructions on using GoToWebinar later in the hearing. Next, I would like to share a few important details about logistics. For in-person attendees, the emergency exits are located to the right and behind. The restrooms are located by entering the hallway through the door to my right and then going right. In the event of an emergency requiring evacuation or flood, this hearing will be automatically closed. If it appears we can return to the building and reopen the hearing within a short period of time, we will do so. If we cannot reopen the hearing tonight, 
and we have not cycled at least once through all of the speakers requesting to be heard, we will endeavor to return to Greenville to reopen the oral public hearing on another date. We will announce the date and time to all persons on the service list, and we will post it on the DES website. If we lose internet connectivity, we will try to reestablish remote testimony. However, the hearing will continue in person. In addition to oral testimony, DES encourages submittal of written testimony. The public comment period for receipt of written testimony will remain open through December 16, 2022 at 4 p.m. Please submit written testimony as specified in the public hearing notice. The purpose of this hearing is to receive oral testimony to identify the concerns of citizens and governing bodies of the host municipality, county and district, and other affected persons on a solid waste permit application submitted by Greater Waste Solutions to DES. In the permit application, Greater Waste Solutions LLC is requesting that DES approve a standard permit application to authorize an expansion of the existing collection, storage, and transfer facility, currently operating under permit number DES SWPN17002, located at 426 Fitchburg Road in Greenville, New Hampshire. The application requests expansion of its operations to allow for acceptance of municipal solid waste construction and demolition debris, and other solid wastes by re relocating the existing scrap metal operations and constructing an approximately 18,000 square foot building for commercial waste and a collection area for residential waste. Notice of this hearing was published in the Monadnock Ledger transcript on November 6, 2022 and November 8, 2022. It was emailed to certified solid waste operators on November 4th, 2022, published in DES's Municipal Ecolink Eco newsletter on October 31st, 2022. It was posted on the DES website, Twitter feed, Facebook page, and lobby bulletin board, and mailed to abutters of the facility, the host municipality, and other affected entities as identified in and required by the New Hampshire Solid Waste Rule. The hearing notice includes the date, time, and place of this hearing, and information for obtaining a copy of the application for review. It also provides instructions and the deadline for submitting written testimony. If you are using GoToWebinar, you can review a copy of the hearing notice by looking in the dashboard under the section titled Handouts. Copies are also available out in the hallway uh, in the cafeteria near the entrance. Now let's review the hearing agenda. First, Jamie Colby will provide a brief overview of the solid waste permit application process and the criteria that DES must use to make its decision to approve or deny the requested permit modification. Jamie will also explain where we currently are in the application review process and what the next step, steps are after this hearing. Second, a representative of Greater Waste Solutions will provide a description of the proposed facility and application. Then we'll take a five minute break. Immediately following the break, we will accept public comment on the application in an orderly fashion. Anyone wish, wishing to make oral comments for DES to consider during its review of the application will have the opportunity to do so during this hearing. Jamie Colby will now provide information about the solid waste permitting process. Thank you, Leah. Good evening, everyone. As we have stated, my name is Jamie Colby, and I'm the Engineering and Permitting Section Supervisor in the Solid Waste Management Bureau at DES. For context, the Solid Waste Management Bureau regulates the management of solid waste primarily by regulating the facilities that handle solid waste. We accomplish this through administration of a permitting system as required by statute, specifically the Solid Waste Management Act, RSA 149M. And as authorized by RFA 149M, the department has adopted administrative rules that apply to solid waste management facilities statewide. As allowed by the statute and the administrative rules, Greater Waste Solutions, LLC, operates a solid waste facility in Greenville, New Hampshire, that is permitted by DES. Greater Waste has submitted a standard permit application to DES, requesting a new permit so that it can expand its operations in Greenville to allow for acceptance of municipal solid waste and construction and demolition debris. 
At this time, I will briefly explain how the department reviews an application like this. In a few minutes, we will hear a presentation from a representative of Greater Waste that provides more details on the proposal, including Greater Waste perspective on the application. DES's role at this time is to review the application to determine whether it meets the requirements of RSA 149M and the New Hampshire Code of Administrative Rules for Solid Waste Management and issue a decision on the application. Generally speaking, review of an application occurs in two steps. The first step involves a completeness determination. That is, we evaluate whether or not we have all of the information required by rule. The second step involves a technical review when we evaluate the technical details of the application and come to a decision. This technical review time period is also when we collect and consider public comments. The first step of this process has been accomplished. DES has determined that greater waste application for an expanded facility is complete. Once we do that, we put out a notice stating that the application is available for public comment and we schedule a public hearing. That is where we are now. We are requesting public comment on greater waste application, which comments we will consider when making a decision on the application. We have not yet made a decision. While we are receiving public comments, the application is concurrently undergoing a technical review. During technical review of an application such as this, we look at the requirements specified in the New Hampshire Solid Waste Rules for a collection, storage, and transfer facility including siting, design, construction, operations, and closure of the facility. For example, during review of the design, we evaluate whether the proposed, proposed facility has safe and efficient on-site traffic patterns and waste storage that meets the technical specifications and performance criteria of the rules. The applicable siting, design, construction, operation, and closure requirements for collection, storage, and transfer facilities are found in Chapter ENV, dash SW 400 of the New Hampshire Solid Waste Rules, which incorporates by reference various other rules found in chapters ENB dash SW 900 through ENB dash SW 1100, as well as ENB dash SW 1400. Once we have received your comments and completed a technical review of the application, we will issue a final decision. We have three options. We can deny the application, we can approve the application outright, or we can approve the application with conditions. The solid waste rules identify the explicit grounds for denial, found in part ENB SW 305.03. The rules and the solid waste statute are available online through either the DES website or the state legislature's website. That's a brief overview of the application review process. Leah? Thank you, Jamie. Next, representatives of Great, Greater Waste Solutions will present a description of the proposed facility for which they are seeking a solid waste facility standard permit. Online. Yeah, yeah, that would be good. So, in front of, yeah, that's come, okay. come stand in front of me. Thank you. Yes, perfect. No bad. Put it in my back. All right. <laughs> Um, good evening. For the record, my name is Chad Brandon. I'm a civil engineer with Fieldstone um, Land Consultants. As um, was previously stated, um, we are before you this evening um, for a public hearing um, for the requirements of a uh, permitting of a proposed solid waste management facility, um, a collection, storage, and transfer facility located at 426 uh, Pittsburgh Road, also known as uh, New Hampshire Route 31 here in town. This facility will be operated by Greater Waste Solutions, LLC. And with me this evening is uh, Brent Glenn and uh, Julie Shaw, who are the owners and members of uh, Greater Waste Solutions, as well as Naomi uh, Claire Prawl, 
who is another um, civil engineer uh, with Novus Group, who is part of our design team. So together, hopefully we'll be able to answer any questions that everybody has this evening, as that certainly is the goal of, of the public hearing uh, process. For those of you that have been following this project, you know that it's been a long road um, for us to get to this point. Um, we started this process, the design of this site and the uh, local permitting actually back in 2017. Um, we received local site plan approval in 2017. And since then, we've been working on securing a number of state permits. This solid waste uh, management permit happens to be the last permit that, that we have to secure um, for this project. Just to give a little bit of background in the um, permitting process, permits that we've already secured for this project include the uh, New Hampshire BES wetlands approval, um, which was obtained in 2018. We also received an alteration of terrain permit um, through the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services that was obtained in 2018 as well. We obtained a um, New Hampshire Department of Transportation access permit. You have to obtain those every time you change a use on the property. That was obtained in 2018. Uh, we have secured local uh, fire department approval for this project. That was, uh, we obtained their sign off in uh, 2020. And we ultimately made our first uh, submission to the Solid Waste Management Bureau back in 2020. And since that time, uh, we have been working with the state on a number of reviews, primarily associated with the uh, facility operations and management, as well as um, um, some of the internal traffic uh, patterns for, for traffic safety on site. So for everybody's benefit, I'm going to take a step back since this project has had such a long road and just give a brief overview of the, of the site and then um, kind of transition into the proposal. The subject site actually consists of three properties, tax map parcels 217.1, 217.2, and 237.1. Those three properties are situated on the east side of New Hampshire Route 31, um, and they consist of 9.344 acres of land. As Part of this permit, those three properties would ultimately be merged into one property. Um, and that, that total area, again, is 9.344 acres of land. The property does have 934 feet of linear feet of frontage along the state highway. But because this section of Route 31 is in a controlled access right away, the site is only permitted one um, access point. So we're proposing to maintain the existing access point um, with this project. And again, that is a permitted location. It's been updated for this um, proposal. This property is located in the commercial zone and the uh, site does meet all dimensional requirements as outlined in the local zoning and site plan um, criteria. The subject site is serviced by municipal sewer and water as well as overhead electric and communications. And currently the property, as was stated, is occupied by Greater Waste Solutions as they are operating a scrap uh, metal collection and recycling uh, center on site. That operation um, does consist of a number of improvements on the property, um, including an office space, which is uh, located here at the end of the property on the right. There is a security uh, building on the right as well. We have a scale existing scale that's directly um, as you come into the property. There is a um, concrete working pad located here. There used to be a formerly metal building on that, but currently it's just a uh, concrete slab. And then we also have a concrete working slab over in that location there. Um, there are a number of other improvements on site, such as access roads, um, processing pads, um, and so on. And there are some jurisdictional wetlands on site. Uh, we have a jurisdictional wetland uh, that kind of bisects the site in the east-west location here. Um, this is actually where the wetlands permit was obtained across that area to get to this isolated upland. 
Um, and then there is a jurisdictional wetland area that parallels the eastern boundary of the project um, as well. Again, this site does meet all dimensional standards requirements um, for um, setbacks, buffering, et cetera. The proposal for this property and the site design for this property is essentially the same plan that was approved back in 2017. We haven't changed any of the layout. We haven't changed the building locations. We haven't changed the um, paved areas. Um, we've simply added some traffic control elements and then we've worked again on um, the operations and maintenance um, details, lots of details um, for, this, for this permit. Taking a look at the site layout, the entrance again will be maintained in its current location here. The scrap metal uh, recycling area will be adjusted on site to accommodate the solid waste portion, portion of the project. So what that means is currently there's scrap metal uh, uh, recycling storage in this location here, kind of centrally on site. That's gonna be relocated to this Northern portion of the site. It's a light and heavy iron um, storage area will be relocated to this area. And that'll allow for um, the solid waste management portions and improvements of the site to, to exist. The office and scale house, as well as the security shack, will remain in their existing locations. There will just be some additional parking and drainage improvements completed in proximity to that area. And then taking a look at um, traffic patterns, commercial traffic will enter this site during business hours. The gate that's located up along the state right away here will be unlocked and opened, while allowing traffic to enter the site. The commercial traffic will enter the project, ultimately be directed to drive past the scale house in, in existing scale and cycle through the project in a clockwise um, rotation, coming back onto the scale here to get weighed in. Um, that traffic pattern is actually a pattern that's been adjusted through the review process um, with, the, with the Solid Waste Management Bureau. Um, because it allows for additional queuing and stacking of commercial vehicles on site, ensuring that there's not going to be any queuing issues or stacking that would be proper. So a full truck would enter the scale, be weighed in, and then ultimately leave um, and, and go to the solid waste um, processing building here on the southern side of the site, or come over to the scrap metal recycling area. On the north side of the site, side of the site excuse me. Once the truck is emptied, they would cycle back to the scale house way empty and then ultimately leave the property in a one directional flow towards the north, heading back out to the entrance and heading north or south on 31, depending on where they came from. The um, residential traffic would come through the site and cycle in a, in a different fashion so that we're separating those traffic patterns. Residential traffic would enter the site and immediately be directed to the left. As you're looking at the plan, it's to the right, but as you're driving in, it would be to the left. There's a barricade um, through the site here. There's a number of barricades throughout the property to make sure that there's adequate separation, providing safe, safe traffic. Um, flow through the property. So residential traffic would come in. This is the um, general public drop-off area. They would come into this location and they would ultimately park. From here, they would dispose of their waste appropriately in a number of bins, just like in any other transfer um, station that, that everybody is accustomed to, I'm sure. Um, we're currently showing 12 bins along the north side here. <clears throat> and then we do have some additional bins over here as well. Um, once, once they dispose of their waste, they would cycle um, to the north, again, in a one directional flow pattern and ultimately leave um, the property. A lot of those details, signage, traffic flow, um, things of that nature were certainly reviewed, discussed and uh, revised. And I think ultimately the plan that we are presenting this evening is, a, is the best plan for the site meeting all of the state criteria. 
This facility will accept uh, municipal solid waste, construction and demolition debris, limbs and yard waste, um, do it yourself used oil, which will be um, used on site in the used oil furnace to heat the heat the um, the office area in the um, scrap metal processing area here, which is in this existing building. Process uh, select recyclables will be accepted: fluorescent lamps, aluminum cans, concrete, brick, and asphalt, metals, glass, tires. Um, tin, ceramics, mixed paper and newspaper, white goods, corrugated cardboard, electronics, bulky items, batteries, and plastic, all of which are outlined um, in detail on the plans that we have before you this evening, but also in our permit pack. The normal um, hours of operation for this facility would be Monday through Saturday, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m the same hours of operation that we presented locally um, and, and obtained approval on, we would be closed on Sundays. The permit will have a maximum quantity to be received daily on average annually of 600 tons with a maximum quantity to be stored at the facility of 1,264 tons. All of those calculations, the different volumes of different um, materials are broken out in detail within our application package. The facility will collect and sort non-hazardous solid waste for recycling and disposal, and will manage certain universal waste items on site as well. Commercial waste handling operations will be done um, within the solid waste processing building. Um, there's a lot of details relative to this building that are located in within our application. There's bins, um, in this building as well for sorting. Um, and then there's a, an area here for loading um, for the uh, transportation of those materials. Petrucible waste storage will not exceed 188 tons in this facility and will be transferred offsite within 24 to 72 hours to prevent odors. The site design and orientation also accounts for this. And for those of you that were able to attend the site plan review, that was a a topic of discussion at that time. Also, this site does have significant buffering to the south and east due to a large wetland complex, which is situated off site here. So the prevailing winds are generally in the south, <coughs> excuse me, easterly direction. So again, the site has been orientated with that in mind, and it's certainly something that has been considered um, with the design of this property in order to mitigate any of those factors. Building placement, setbacks, distance to abutters, and uh, natural buffering, natural topography um, will provide for effective shielding. Um, and as a result, there should be very few problems with noise, odors, dust, or windblown litter. The operations and um, maintenance plans for this proposal, this this property deal with normal um, routine practices on site and how um, things will be checked and cleaned up in an orderly fashion. The site has been designed to meet all water quality standards as well through the implementation of a, a very detailed stormwater management plan. Um, that plan has been reviewed and approved uh, through the alteration of terrain bureau. Um, and you know that that uh, that's really being achieved primarily through two um, stormwater management areas located in the northeast and northwest corners of the site. All of the stormwater from this facility will be captured and routed to those areas where um, qualitative and quantitative mitigation of that stormwater will occur. <clears throat> and that's done through a combination of um, closed and open um, drainage systems. This facility ultimately will provide um, an increased convenience in the area for residents and local haulers um, who might otherwise travel, travel greater uh, distances to disposal sites. So that's a very brief overview of the um, proposal that we have before you. Um, again, it's, it's essentially the same as, as, as what we presented locally um, back in 2017. Um, but we're here tonight to, to try to answer any questions or concerns that, that
that uh, you know the public may have, and, and so we'll do our best to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you do want to Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I just want to address something that that uh, that you just mentioned. I, I just want to um, set the scene for this evening, and I'll go back into the script in a moment. Um, if the applicant and their representatives want to stay after the formal hearing to engage in sort of a dialogue and a back and forth and question and answer, you're more than welcome to do that. But the purpose of this hearing is for the department to receive your public comments. Um, I don't anticipate. Um, doing a lot of question and answer or, or quite frankly, any. It's really important for us to understand your concerns, um, unless it's a really, really easy question, a number of something, we're, we're likely not going to have the opportunity to, uh, to do that during the formal um, public comment process. So in a few moments, we will take a break. However, I would like to explain the ground rules for the testimony portion of the hearing and provide instructions for delivering oral testimony. Our objective this evening is to give everyone who wishes to speak a reasonable opportunity to do so. After you have provided your name in accordance with the upcoming instructions, I will call on people to speak in the order displayed on the screen. Based on the number of attendees, I request that you limit your testimony to three minutes. Mark will be monitoring your time and will show the yellow card when you have one minute left. When you see the yellow card, please start wrapping up your testimony. When Mark shows the red card, <laughs> that's the yellow one. That's the one. And when Mark shows the red card, that means time is up. Please graciously yield the floor without significant delay so that I can call the next speaker in line. If you have not finished your testimony and wish to be called again to speak, please request to have your name added back to the list. We are frequently asked whether a speaker can yield their time to another speaker of their choice. This practice will not be allowed during this hearing. Instead, we intend to proceed through the list of names to give everyone the time they need to provide their comments. In other words, the person you might wish to yield your time to will have plenty of opportunity to testify. They will just need to request to testify and wait for their turn in line. When I call your name, if you decide you wish not to speak at that time, let me know and we will place your name at the bottom of the list to be called on after all of our speakers have cycled. If you are here at the SAU 87 office and wish to turn in written testimony this evening, please place it in the designated box to be receipt stamped and secured as part of the official record. You'll find that box next to the cafeteria's entrance. If you are accessing this hearing remotely, please submit written testimony as instructed in the notice of public hearing. As a reminder, a copy of that hearing notice is available on the DES website, in the GoToWebinar dashboard under handouts, and here in the cafeteria. We often receive questions about how someone can receive notice when DES issues a decision on the application. Everyone who is registered to attend the hearing remotely or who filled out a testimony card with their contact information will be placed on the list for receiving notice when a decision on the application is issued. Those folks who did not fill out a testimony card or register for the hearing, but would still like to receive notice of the, the decision can add their name to the sheet at the table near the cafeteria entrance or contact the Solid Waste Management Bureau by email at swpublic.comment at des.nh.gov or by calling area code 603-271-2925. As a reminder, this hearing is being recorded. Therefore, during the public testimony session, please speak clearly and start your testimony by stating your name. If you forget to do so, I will briefly interrupt you to remind you. If you are here in person and would like to provide oral comments, please fill out a testimony card and place it in the designated box if you have not already done so. DES staff will add your name to the list that will be displayed on the screen. Tara, do we have any remote attendees? Yes. If you are accessing this public hearing remotely, please listen closely to the following instructions on how to provide oral testimony using GoToWebinar. As a reminder, these instructions are not applicable to our telephone-only attendees who are in listen-only mode. 
For oral testimony, we will enable the GoToWebinar question function. Using this function, you will let DES know you would like to provide oral testimony by entering your identifying information into the GoToWebinar question box. I will walk through specific instructions on how to do this in a moment. Please note that we are not actually soliciting questions to be answered this time. We are using GoToWebinar's question function to identify who would like to be called upon to provide oral testimony and to assist us in tracking testimonies. Please enter only your name, address, and who you represent in the question box. The information typed in the question box is not your testimony, and you should not type any substantive content in this box. In order to be added to the list to provide oral testimony, you do need to enter your name, address, and who you represent. We traditionally attempt to provide state senators and representatives the opportunity to speak first, and we would like to do so during this hearing. If you are a senator or representative participating remotely and would like to be called upon early in the queue, please write senator or representative before your name. We will attempt to put you up front in the queue. The question function of GoToWebinar is now enabled. Tara, would you please confirm? Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> you should now see the question box in the GoToWebinar dashboard. If you want to provide testimony, please type your name, address, and who you represent in the question box, then hit enter to submit. We will be monitoring the list of attendees who are submitting this information and will place your name in the queue. Remember that if you need technical assistance with getting onto the list to provide testimony, Julie Ashton of DES is available by phone or email. You can reach Julie by phone at 603-271-7837 or by email at julie.a.ashton at des.nh.gov. We will now take a short break to enter names on the list and we'll be back in five minutes. I have a question. I have two people who did not say they'd like to speak, but they're currently just in the room. Can I not say anyone who wants to speak? So, Henry, Henry Bowen, yeah. did you want to speak? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. And then Doug Reardon. He just walked out. Okay. okay. <laughs> he should be the bottom of it. I'll catch him when he comes back. All right. Yes. Would you mind taking this back? It's kind of hard to see the screen. Thank you. 
this evening is to give everyone who wishes to speak a reasonable opportunity to do so. If your testimony will not fit inside the allotted time of three minutes, you are welcome to resume during a subsequent round of testimony. Also, please be respectful of each other. There may be differing viewpoints represented by the participants of this hearing, and issues can be emotionally charged. In all cases, I ask that all participants honor the process of being able to hold a public hearing to hear differing viewpoints and concerns by extending each other courtesy and civility. We will begin hearing oral testimony at this time. I will call on individuals one at a time. For in-person participants, DES will manage some microphones in this. We don't have one. We're okay. Yeah, we For remote participants, please ensure that your microphone is not muted. When called on, begin your testimony by stating your name and then proceed with your comment. <coughs> We do have multiple people who have indicated they would like to provide testimony. Our first person will be Henry Valancourt, and then we have Timothy Washburn. Henry, when I turn the floor over to you, please come up to the podium. Please start by stating your name and you have the floor. My name is Henry Valancourt, and I live at the intersection of Route 31 and Mill Street, approximately one quarter of a mile from the project now being discussed, and approximately one half mile from the facility owned by the same company on Old Wilton Road. 
I have lived there my entire life with two generations before me. I have serious concerns over the proposed expansion of this facility over the presently permitted 30 tons per day capacity, to one allowing for 600 tons per day, six days a week, and a sounding 20 times greater volume. In the applicant's permit promo, uh, proposal, it is stated in the section, the title, discussion of the impacts the facility will have on traffic, and I quote, New Hampshire Route 31 along this section is underutilized with low traffic volumes, unquote. I think if you ask anyone living along Route 31, if they think that it is underutilized, you would not find them in agreement with this statement. Route 31 is a direct north-south connector between Fitchburg, Mass, and surrounding communities and Route 101 in New Hampshire. As such, it receives a lot of commuter and truck traffic on a daily basis. It is also a road of many accidents and Greenville police can testify to the fact that it is the most dangerous road in town. The intersection of Mill Street and Route 31 where I live has been the scene of one or two accidents a year in recent times, two of which I assisted to recently with my neighbor Tony across the street as we were the first on the scene. It is also an area of numerous near accidents. Whenever I hear someone leaning on his horn or the squeal of brakes, I get ready to run. In 1986, a car drove right through the wall of my house into my living room. And a few years earlier on Christmas Eve, two cars came within five feet of crashing through the kitchen wall of my mother's house, also located on the property. And since then, there have been many that ended up on our property at various distances from the road. There have likewise been a number of accidents in recent years near the Country Mile, located about a mile south of, from the applicant's property, and also at the intersection of Route 31 and Route 124. A car out of control is one thing. A heavily loaded truck is quite another, and nothing would slow down the, the momentum when it hits the house. As such, I live in dread of this happening someday, and am constantly alert. Uh, my situation with the house being located downhill from the road makes me particularly vulnerable. Although the intersection of Mill Street and Route 31 is posted at 35 miles an hour, few cars and trucks obey this, including those of the applicant's facility on Old Wilton Road. Instead, they hit the gas, reaching speeds of around 60 to gain momentum as they climb the hills going south. And it is this direction of traffic that makes my property most vulnerable but they also don't necessarily slow down going down the hill at this intersection. And the level of noise from these speeds becomes nerve wracking very quickly. When I read that according to the applicant that Route 31 is underutilized with low traffic volumes, I have to ask, underutilized as compared to what? Route 101, Route 3? Is the goal to have every road to be utilized to the max with no regard for safety or quality of life issues? Would someone living on the outskirts of these towns on a quiet country road be happy to have his road widened and turned into another Route 31, or worse yet, Route 101? Where do we draw the line to address these quality of life issues? When will Greenville start saying no to projects that would never pass in other communities? Do you think this proposal would have a chance of passing in Hollis or Amherst? And we are not talking here of dealing with our own town-generated waste which would be an admirable and responsible thing to do, but taking in waste over a very large area that others might enjoy a pristine environment in their own community while we become their dumping ground. Greenville has the smallest land area in the entire state, and it is imperative that we use and develop it wisely for the benefit of all its citizens over the profit of a few. The, uh, the offer in this present proposal to allow residents to recycle this facility is an insignificant benefit, as most people already have curbside pickup by this company or its competitors, or make the short trip to Wilton Recycling, often in combination with a shopping trip at Market Basket or elsewhere. On the other hand, developments such as Washburn's Windy Hill Orchard, which has been voted one of the best in the state and withdraws people from a wide area to a beautiful scenic location, uh, uh, gives a very favorable impression of the town and its development and its development done in a good direction. A trans processing facility does not generate the same favorable applause. As an example of another positive, the time is up. We'll be happy to add you back to the yes, list. Yes, please do. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Next, we have Timothy Washburn and after that, Michael Sadowski. My biggest concern, <clears throat> number one, is the noise. We get a lot of noise now from the uh, 
from the metal operation down there. Um, but the new uh, application calls for six days a week, 12 hours a day, six to six. Now today talking with uh, Browning, yeah, Glenn Jr. Um, he said that uh, the hours of operation are actually from eight to four, and he's only gonna use the six to 12 for emergency services only. But I kind of thought it should be specified that way in the application if that's the case. Um, and the other thing, you know, with the 600, 600 tons a day is a massive amount of some mom and pop operations. So it's just, I'm really concerned with all the trucks. Second thing would be the uh, ODA. I don't know what to expect for that. We bought a, we, you know, we know Washburn's Moody Hill Orchard. We have a bakery, we have apple orchard, picnic areas, whatever. Um, if it smells like a landfill up there, um, it's not going to be too good. Plus, we live there. So that's another big concern of mine. Um, and the trash, uh, the 188 tons of trash that are going to be, they can keep for 24 to 72 hours. He explained that's because of the weekend. But um, there's a weekend every week. So I don't know what that's going to do as far as that goes. And pretty much that's about it right now. Thank you for testimony. Michael Sadowski and then Marshall Bucket. Hey, ma'am. Uh, I guess one of my main concerns is that I've pretty much been all over the world, literally. Uh, when you put a bunch of metal in one place, you know, you're going to have a lot of leaching out, rust, the corrosion, things like that. And that's going to leach out into the, um, into the wetlands itself. And then, does that jump? Uh, Mr. Valancourt, it, it goes downhill and that goes downhill and hits like kind of like a brook and then goes to the river. So I don't know what that really is going to do to the South Hegan. I don't know how, what type of uh, mitigation they have for controlling hazardous waste, rust, things like, like I said, corrosion, things like that. Um, to echo Mr. Valancourt, he's right about that intersection. It's 35, but our police department doesn't actually enforce it, unfortunately. In, the applicant, I've seen his trucks, I go to work in the morning and his trucks fly through there. It's kind of unacceptable. Um, and then for Mr. Washburn, yeah, he owns a business right there where it's all food and everything. Last thing you're gonna want is to tear down his business because of the fact that, you know, he has people eating outside and they don't want to eat, smell trash. That's right there. It was such a large wetland area. I don't know why we would want to put a trash facility right next to a wetland anyways. That's a protected area for a reason. You know, this isn't out in the middle of the desert or, or even a place like uh, like Wilton, although that's close to the river as well. But I don't see a wetland there at all. So I don't know what their mitigations are. I just think that um, this large facility and going, again, going from 30, 30 tons a day to 600, that's, that's, a, that's a lot of waste. And what Mr. Washburn says is, yeah, you're taking that from outside areas from here. Probably mass, obviously here. There's really no benefit to the town just being this small and yeah, that large of a facility because we're not going to be servicing anybody. Wilton's still going to stay open. They're not closing. So other places are going right to that as well. You know, then right up the road, you got Amherst Transfer Facility. And if you've ever driven 101 and they got a long road, they're still parked on 101. And with limited access here and on 31, I don't know what the traffic's going to end up doing backed up on 31. And that, that's a speed limit that's 50 miles an hour. I've actually petitioned the state to say, or I went through the town, petitioned the state to reduce the speed by the country mile. They wouldn't even do it in a more congested area. So I don't know what types of accidents are going to kind of happen there. So, you know, I don't know if it's going to take a life to, to change it or not, but that is what it is. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for testimony. Marshall Buttrick and Chester Price after. My name is Marshall Buttrick. I live at 240 Adams Hill Road here in Greenville. And I have a procedural issue and then a substantive issue. And the procedural issue is one in which I would suggest that those that are going to be making the decision regarding this application actually visit the site. And I think it would help you immensely in understanding what residents have for concerns and being able to apply 
that to that. It's one thing to look at paper. It's another thing to see it right out there as you go forward. And so my concern would be that a site walk should be made by those who are actually making the decision. The second issue is a substantive issue regarding runoff. And I'm concerned about runoff on that property to the south and to the east. To the south, there is a major swamp, and to the east is the Blood Brook, and both drain down. Tonight, I've heard regarding that there might be, there is a plan to deal with that. I'd be concerned about that to make sure that there is no direct infiltration going into either the brook or the swamp. Then I have concerns regarding what the exterior lighting is going to be. What are abutters and people in the area going to be seeing at night? Is it going to be lit up severely or is it going to be dealt with environmentally so that there isn't a lot of light pollution as it goes forward? And those are my major concerns here tonight. Thank you for testimony. Um, this is a comment from David. Uh, I'm actually going it's going in and out of the community from the swamp. I'm just letting you know that that has. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Price, I wish Tom Tom Falter. This time. Okay. Thank you, sir. Next, we have Tom Falter, followed by Kim Kieran. Hi. Um, I didn't really plan on anything like the, the authors over here, but I, I think that this project's a, a, a very big benefit for the town of Greenville, especially. Uh, our waste situation now with the uh, with the Wilton dump that is it advantageous for the town? The traffic that they talked about. Uh, the only reason why we have businesses on 31 is because there's traffic. Uh, and I expect there's going to be more if we have more businesses. When we did the master plan for the uh, for the town, this is exactly what we wanted to see on 31. This is exactly if you read it, that where businesses were before the zoning and the master plan. There was, uh, there was many plans for different condos, apartments along 31. Uh, it's in character with, with that stretch of road. We have a salvage yard there. We have another recycling yard uh, further down. In proximity to the property, there's an old dump. I used to bring my trash up there. We didn't have the services that were going to be provided now. It was just a, like a free for all. The thing was always on fire most of the time as well. So. I, I can only see uh, advantages for the town for this, for this project to go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Jim Kearney, and then back to Mr. Valancourt. Jim Kearney, 37 Old Mason Center Road. I live just on downhill from my proposed site, and my concerns are open. A lot like everyone else's, uh, you know. Once once the facility fills up with traffic, where does the other traffic go? Um, it is a limited access highway, so they're only going to have the one driveway at a time. Um, again, with the runoff, um, if it rains hard enough, everything's going to wash off. They have in their site plan detention ponds and retention ponds that they can, I imagining, open and close the drainage for to sort of restrict the flow. But what is what is going to filter what's being washed into those ponds? I'm not hearing that there's going to be any sort of a filtering system whatsoever for what might be running off. So maybe somewhere in the site plan there should be something that would collect the water, run it through some sort of a simple gravel filter or something to start to mitigate that even before it gets to the retention and detention ponds and then flows down the street. Um, Another question was, well, another concern is with the bin flow where the household waste would be dropped off. Is there going to be some sort of a time limit for people to pull up, deposit their trash and leave? They're going to be able to stand there and talk with neighbors and things like that. And because uh, it doesn't, if there's going to have that kind of a flow to it, there's not going to be a lot of time for someone to be there for any real amount of time. Um, not that. You know, I mean, everybody sees everybody in certain places. And, um, the the, the, the uh, recycling center is usually one of them. Um, but I just think that would lead to a back backup of traffic and then it pours out onto the highway and once again, the stacking issue. Um, and then obviously the noise. And uh, as Mr. Butcher pointed out, I think it's a great good idea for uh, to have the site visited by 
those making the decisions. Um, you know, the other concern is the amount of truck traffic that's going to be to be showing up. Um, you know, with 600,000, 600 tons a day, um, you know, it's going to be a considerable amount of considerable amount of trucks. And um, what periods of the day are they going to be showing up? Which kind of get out in the morning, bring them all here, and then again you have that stacking issue with tractor trailers out on the highway. So I guess those are my immediate concerns. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Mr. Valencourt. Round two, I guess. As an example of another positive development of a different type, the Dollar General has been a very useful addition to the town and allows citizens the convenience of a local hardware, grocery, and five in ten that we once had in town. Consider also how our approval of projects that would be rejected in other communities makes us appear in the eyes of our neighbors. There is a history here. Greenville seems to be the target of repeated proposals that would never have a chance anywhere else. In the 80s and 90s, we had a proposal for a dynamite storage facility across from the Country Mile store, and later for a garbage incineration facility on the present Lamar Concrete property. Can you imagine Hollis or Amherst, or indeed almost any other community, entertaining these projects? And consider also how it makes the town of Greenville an easy target for any developer with a project that would be difficult or impossible to pass elsewhere. I have reviewed the minutes of the planning board's meeting dated July 27, 2017, giving, and I quote, conditional approval for the non-residential site plan. Nowhere in these minutes is there any mention of a conversion of the presently permitted 30 ton per day facility, the one processing 600 tons per day. In notices to abutters, it is mentioned that the daily intake would be 600 tons, 600 tons, but again, there was no indication that this was a dramatic increase in volume. One might well think that 600 tons was the volume process at the present facility. In the present DES notice of public hearing, there is again nothing concerning the change in volume from 30 tons per day to 600. The change in volume is the most troubling aspect of this proposal, and yet nowhere is there mentioned in anything I have found, any indication that there was to be a 20 times increase in volume from 30 tons to 600 tons every day for six days a week. One discovers this from the permit for this facility dated April 19, 2017, that states, and I quote, the rate of incoming authorized waste shall be limited to 30 tons a day, unquote. Without doing this research, you might assume that the facility in the present proposal would operate as it has for, e for years and would probably not find objection from the majority of people. If the proposal is scaled back to the 30 tons permitted in 2017, I believe you will find general approval, even with the inclusion of household waste added to metal recycling. But the impact of 600 tons on a daily basis, six days a week, coming and going on traffic, noise, and possible pollution cannot possibly not lead to a degradation of the quality of life we enjoy in our small town. In conclusion, ask yourselves, will the quality of life in Greenville be better after this huge expansion of a waste treatment facility? I would be interested in hearing your arguments. Thank you. Mr. Price? I'm also. Okay. Seeing no one else who wishes to provide oral testimony, I'm going to prepare to close the hearing. Please understand that written comments can be submitted to the DES up to 4 p.m. on December 16, 2022. They can be emailed or submitted by mail, and directions for submitting written comments are provided in the public notice for this hearing. Before closing the hearing, I'm going to confirm that we are still connected to our remote participants. Tara, would you please confirm that connection? Thank you. And thank you everyone for taking the time to participate in this public hearing. This hearing is hereby closed at 7.36 p.m.